from Women Talk Live. Okay, great. Thanks so much. It's so exciting to be here. Um, welcome to the second event in Rediscovering Anna Ella Carroll, um, the whole series. And this is exciting for me because not a Marylander being raised in Virginia, this has been a learning experience for me for the first time. And so I look forward to hearing from our uh, panel of distinguished experts. Um, and we're fortunate to have three um, really knowledgeable individuals who have unique perspectives and expertise on Anna Ella Carroll and also on women in the military in general. And so let me tell you a little bit about each one of these before they get started. And um, you will understand while they are on this panel. Um, they've all done so much, and it would be, we would spend the next rest of the afternoon be telling you about them. If that, I read their bios because they're so incredibly long and full of information. And so if you'd like to know more about them, just request um, and we'll get the information to you. And finally, last but not least, certainly not least. June Willits served as the executive director of the American Veterans Committee for 40 years, bringing into Veterans Affairs the ABC's unique perspective of Citizens First, Veterans Second. She became the first woman to head the leadership conference on the Civil Rights Task Force on Military Veterans Affairs. She was also the first to chair a presidential subcommittee on disabled veterans, where she was cited for her outstanding leadership. June developed the first legal aid project for veterans with discharge problems and worked with Congress to create special offices for women and minorities within the Veterans Administration. She is the author of Women Veterans, America's Forgotten Heroines that documented a pattern of neglect by government agencies and received broad attention resulting in congressional hearings and remedial actions. The ABC created a Woman in Military Service for America Foundation that was endorsed by Congress, which led to the building of the National Women Veterans Memorial at Arlington Cemetery. June Valencia's efforts contributed to having women and armed conflict issues included in the 1995 UN Conference on Women's Platform for Action. One result has been women's increased influence in the international arena, as noted in the UN Security Council resolutions and actions that now seek to include women in peacemaking and peacekeeping activities, as well as post-conflict reconstruction strategies. Um, talk with us about uh, what's going on today, the opportunities and the obstacles that women in the military are facing. And we all know there's been a lot in the news, so we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. I'm going to be coming from a different perspective. The story of uh, Anna Ella Carroll is an amazing one. But there always have been exceptional women who have not had their due. I want to talk about women, the average woman, who played a role in history, and that is military history. The women who served, I wrote my book calling them the forgotten heroines. They were, and they still are. And I want to tell you how I came to this. Because I had been working for a men's veterans organization for a number of years, and I knew there were women out there who had served because I was in World War II in college and when I graduated I was in defense industry and I knew that some of my classmates had joined something called the WAC. But that's where it left off. Anyway, by chance I was in this position. In 1977, the National Academy of Medicine did a study of the VA medical system, particularly the hospital system. And they put out, as government agencies do, a big report. And in the preface, it said that this study will not include women. Well, <laughs> I'm a nosy kind of person, so I said, why won't it include women? And the answer is, there weren't enough of them. 
So I started to ask questions around to find out who were these women and how many were there? Well, not surprisingly, nobody seemed to know. <laughs> but eventually we were able to put together that there were over a million women, living women veterans. And this group was not considered important enough to be considered. So we have Miss Carroll, who did enormous things, and then we have the military women. And I want to go back a little bit in the history of military women in this country, because they do go back a long way. Not necessarily as part of the formal military establishment, but as volunteers. And that, I think, is the story of women. Women are volunteers, and have been, and continue to be. And many of them are right here in this room. Anyway, they took uh, volunteer roles with Washington's Army. They were not many, but they were, uh, they were called women of the Army. They were not in the Army, but they did a lot of the chores that the Army required. They were in all the wars since then. It wasn't until, actually, the 20th century where women were formally included in the military forces of this country. And we can look at World War I when generals in the field asked that women be included in the force. Why? Because they needed the men to go elsewhere. They needed them to fight. And all the support roles were not being filled if they used the men for what they were supposed to be there for. And there was a draft, and these were not volunteers. So the word was put out, and there were women who came and, and uh, were inducted. They were called the Yeomanettes of World War One, mm. And there were less than 20,000, but they were in uniform, but they were not actually a formal part of the military. They were in the Marines. There was a much smaller group. There were less than 1,000. They were called Marinettes. And these women were not just nurses, but they did telephone operating, filing, all kinds of office work. And when the war was over and the men were released, that there had been a draft, the women left until the beginnings of World War II. And that's how I really became interested in why these women volunteered when the word was out that the military was recruiting women into the forces. And as I said, it was not just nurses, although they always were an important part of the military force, but they were women who came voluntarily. And I had the good fortune of being able to interview a number of these women. And that's where I really learned about what women do and how they are not given credit for what they do. So I asked, these were older women. I, I did the research in the late 70s and the early 80s. And these were the women, I would say, who helped pave the way for the women's movement of the 60s. I asked, why did you, why did you join? And I got some very interesting answers. One of them said, I can recall this, she said, well, my brother was called up. Of course, there was a draft. My brother was called up. He had red blood, and so did I. <laughs> and I didn't see any reason why I should not go. That was one answer. And then there was another answer that was given to me um, saying, I am not going to be Polly by the fire while my brothers 
and my friends are fighting a war. So what you had then, and by the way, there was a very divided opinion in the War Department, in the Congress, and probably in the general population about whether women should be included in this war effort. Despite that, the women who joined the military, and they were the wax, and then there was the Marines, and um, they, the first units were not formally military. They were auxiliaries, so they would never became veterans. They had no benefits and they had no protections. They didn't have any protections whatsoever. And one of the most famous of them, of which there have been several films, were the WASPs. They were the women Air Force pilots who ferried planes from here to England. That was the time of the Battle of Britain, and those planes were urgently needed. They ferried them. They flew the planes with targets so that Air Force pilots could practice on them. And they were about a thousand, there were only about a little over a thousand of these women. They were, had to be pilots before they were taken into this very, a very elite outfit that was at Avenger Field in Texas. And uh, each one of their stories is, was remarkable. I had the good fortune to go to one of their reunions in the early 80s. And there weren't a thousand left, there were only maybe about 700 left. But they were as feisty and <laughs> as uh, interesting and as curious uh, as you can imagine. It was, a, it was an experience just to be around them. But these were the women that helped the Battle of Britain because if we had not been able to get the planes over, they could not have been able to, to protect the homeland. Anyway, this is just a taste of what I got because I found that uh, wherever I went, I came across these women. And uh, some of them stayed on after the war, after the war was over. And by the way, um, there have been statements made that without the women backing up the men, that we, the war might have taken a different turn. That's of course is conjecture, but that has been said. And by the way, I must mention the women at the home front, because there was a, I was in college at that time, and there was all of a sudden, there was an enormous evacuation. All the men were gone. They were all, either they either volunteered or they were drafted. And so who was gonna run the streetcar? Who was gonna do all the, all the things that were being done by men? Don't forget, women were not in the workforce at that time. It's not so long ago, it's only two generations ago. But they were not, I know my own mother was in the house, as were all the other friends of mine, mothers in the house. So what happens? It's the women who come out and they take over all the civilian necessities to keep a society going. Not only that, but they also ran the factories that built the munitions. Of course, you all know the myth of Rosie the Riveter, except it's not a myth. <laughs> There were the women in the factories. Anyway, so they had as much part in helping the war effort, so to speak, as the women who went into service, who did all kinds of things. Uh, and there were women casualties. There were women, not just nurses, but there were oper uh, telephone operators and other support groups that were in the battle fields of France and the rest of Europe. And there were casualties. 
Well, the interesting thing is, is that the women never thought of themselves one as heroines. They never thought of themselves as playing a major role, really, in the history of the country. And I think that still continues to this day. But to continue, after uh, World War II, the auxiliaries were disbanded, as were the um, as what as as were the troops demobilized. And what happened? The women had taken men's jobs during the war. The men were demobilized. What did they do? They came back and wanted their jobs back. Now, the GI Bill of Rights was conceived partially to, to greet that conundrum. This huge flux of over two million men coming back home, the survivors, and the women sent back into the kitchen, so to speak. And uh, it's interesting because some of the women wanted to stay on. And by the way, another, another reason that the women gave me, and this was repeated over and over again, was that I wanted to have an adventure. That was another thought. I wanted to see what the world was like. I wanted to get out of the home. I wanted a broader life. And so when the women came, were sent, so to speak, back to the kitchen, most of them did go back. But many did not. And as you know, after the war, there were, uh, the United States all of a sudden had a whole new role as a world leader, helping to rebuild Europe. Uh, <clears throat> and that meant, what did the women do? So many, I would, probably most of the women, the majority, did go back into the home. But they were different. They were not the same women who left. Mm -hmm. They had not only had an adventure, they had learned a lot. Their horizons had broadened. And they had learned that they themselves had self-reliance. They could learn, they could take on all kinds of roles that they never thought possible. So they were not the same women who came back. I can remember my own mother, who all of a sudden became the president of the PTA. And she went out and she studied and she went out to work as did so many women did. That was really the beginning, I would say, of the women's movement that came to a head in the 60s. It was that generation that had been changed by the women who were in the military and the women who had gone into the civilian sector and manned the whole sector. You didn't see many men around. They were not there. They were overseas and they were elsewhere. So what happened then? The reason I, I, I am going to get to what Anne has suggested to talk about <laughs> their position today. But I wanted to give you this background because it's been a bumpy road for women in the military. They were, they were discharged because there was, uh, there was no place for them. But then, in 1948, the military discovered that, that they missed the women's input. So they, they set up another whack. And that began to take women again. And now, they were part of the military, so they could use the GI Bill of Rights. And that was one of the issues. So many of the women who served during World War II did not realize that they were veterans, even though they were in the auxiliary, and they were eligible for veterans' benefits. And I can think of one woman whom I met on the <coughs> Eastern Shore, who was a farmer, whom I had, uh, someone had put me in contact with her, and it turned out that she had joined, she had been an artist. And um, she joined because, because her brothers had joined. And then when she came out, 
she got married, and she wanted to, she married an Englishman, in fact, and she wanted to do farming, where she could also do some artistic work on the side. In fact, I think she was well known. And she did not know. She needed a loan to purchase the farm and get started. She did not know that she was eligible for the farm part of the Bill of Rights. So they borrowed and they scraped and they got a farm. And I came out to the Eastern Shore a couple of times to talk to the women there, and the men, by the way. <laughs> but this was the kind of thing that was, the other things, that women never expected something in return. That's the reason I said they were the true volunteers. They did it because it was needed and because they wanted the help. And I think this has continued in many of the areas that women are so proficient. It's a different world today. I can't even begin to tell you how different it is. Many of you know that. Anyway, so what happened was that again the Congress is divided, again the public is divided. Do they want women in the military? Some say no, some say yes. General Eisenhower wanted a permanent women's court. Well, they've got it eventually. And then eventually the women's corps was integrated into the regular army. And then eventually uh, basic training was integrated. Then it was unintegrated. Then it was integrated back. <laughs> so it's been a very bumpy road. However, in 1973, the old draft system, which really manned the services during wartime, and after Vietnam, actually, Vietnam was still going on, it was felt that it was time for the, a volunteer only. And it's interesting because the same general um, drift that was occurring in the United States was occurring in other countries. Most of the European countries after the war, except Germany, which had no army, um, they were also had had a draft system. At the same time, it was becoming much more of a technological army. And with the, I, many of you will remember what a, what a very contentious war that was, how it divided the country, and how there was only a bit of taste during and after that war. Anyway, so, so the military decided, and I guess, and they got the assent of Congress to set up an all-volunteer force, which was very interesting because there was room for women. The two, there had been a 2% ceiling on women's participation in peacetime. That was taken away, so there's no more ceiling. And so, over and over you hear, women are going to be an important part of this all-voluntary force. And so they were. And they went from 2%. Today, they are 15% of our own forces. And this sort of brings us to today, because, as Anne said, there are obstacles for women in the armed forces today, and there are opportunities. So let me talk about the opportunities first. And it would be interesting to note that among the enlisted women, 30% are minorities. 30% way beyond the, their percentage in the civilian world. So, because the economy was up and down. They were not getting the volunteers, the men. The men were not. There was a lot of employment at that time, and there were plenty of jobs around. And as we know from our, from our own experiences of the last 20 years, when the employment uh, is bad, the recruitment goes up. So. It was a bumpy road because from the very beginning of the 
or volunteer force when individuals were given military occupational specialties. It was made very clear that women were not going to be admitted not only into the combat specialties, but to the support specialties. So that meant that there was a whole role, realm of employment, which employment is essentially the model for the all volunteer force. Why are people being re recruited? Why are they going in? They go in for employment, for education, for adventure as well. So a lot depends what's going on in the civilian sector. So the role of women became very important. So when it, when it was hard to recruit men, they opened more specialties to women. So more women came in. But, and, and it's interesting because both the women and minorities have pointed out they went in because there was a more level playing field in the military sector than it was in the civilian sector. Women saw the possibilities of moving up, of getting education, and as in the, to use the cliche, the cliche, equal pay for equal work. In other words, the male and the female, the same specialty, they got the same pay. And that was very important. That's the reason both non-college women and college women went into the military during the 80s and the 90s. But, so what's the situation? The women brought, uh, go in, they do well. Their, their qualities are being recognized. Their leadership potential is being recognized. They rise, they, they become sergeants, captains, so on. But then there's a, a glass ceiling. They can't go above another rank because you have to have had been in the combat specialties. Mm -hmm. And you're blocked for the combat specialties. Mm -hmm. So how do you get that kind of experience? You don't. So you don't become a flag officer. You don't become an admiral. You don't become a four-star general. But something interesting has happened this year. And it's probably the result of the change of warfare where there is no match and no line. There is no fixed battle. We know that from our experience in, in Iraq, Afghanistan, and, and also we know it from Vietnam and Korea as well. So the women are rising. In fact, they have a higher percentage of women officers for the women as for the men. But they are still blocked. So there's been, but in our culture, there's been a very strong element opposed to, quote, women coming back and bonding that is. Except that's what's happened. And that's been happening. And it happened during World War II, and it happened in Korea, and it happened in Vietnam. And it certainly is happening even more so now. So there has been a very strong movement and push to open up those specialties to women. And in the last few years, slowly, some of the support groups have opened up, the support specialties. I mean, you know, a truck driver. Uh, so many specialties are close to where people are beginning killed. They're fighting. So finally, I don't know if you noticed it because I was looking for it, but finally, there was a lot of pressure and the Department of Defense, Secretary Panetta, finally, finally eliminated the combat exclusion from, for women so that women can enter these specialties. What's going to happen, we don't know. But we know that women are doing everything else in the military. So it had, it has been seen as a source of upward mobility, of education, of realizing leadership potential. 
So that's one of the positive opportunities that has come out of the military service. Now, but what are the obstacles today? And Anne mentioned the pattern of sexual harassment and sexual abuse that we read about in the papers all the time. And they have been very, very much in the newspapers and whatever you, wherever you read them um, about the cases. And there, it's a long history of, it's nothing new. Unfortunately, it has been part of the military culture. And it's very sad to say that and to admit that. But for example, last year, there were reported, reported 26,000 plus cases of sexual harassment and sexual abuse. Of those 26,000, only a little more than 3,000 reached the point of being considered by an Article 15, which is the Uniform Code of Military Justice's way of first addressing complaints. And of those 3,000, a very few are being adjudicated. So that is an ongoing obstacle, and it's a real problem. In fact, for the women who suffer that, so of course, women can get out, so they leave. And there was a period for a while uh, during the Reagan years where women were getting out more frequently than was expected. And I don't think they've ever done an analysis of why that was happening. But I wouldn't be surprised if a lot had to do with this culture which accepted, you know, boys will be boys and that kind of thinking. And the fact is that so many, and women have reported this, so many don't even report it because they feel it's hopeless. And one of the reasons is the so-called command influence, the way the Uniform Code of Military Justice works is that you have to go to your commanding officer mm -hmm. and, and he or she, by the way, has to take it from there. And as you can imagine, not too many get beyond that. So there has been a lawsuit and uh, as somebody mentioned, there has been legislation introduced in the Congress, Senator Gillibrand, and she has, she, her bill has uh, 10 or 12 uh, <clears throat> other senators, male and female. That legislation, in fact, just this year, it's so fresh. However, however, sadly and disappointingly, the chair of the Armed Services Committee, Senator Levin, did not accept so that is one of the major obstacles. The other thing is that, I don't have to tell you, women are finding and opening many new fields in the, in the civilian sector as well. So, uh, and the word is out, not the word, but it's also in the Pentagon budget, that we're gonna have a smaller military force. So in that case, probably, there will be fewer opportunities for women as well. So I've gone on, and I just wanted to, to share with you some of these issues, and to just say one more thing, that women have not recognized how far they've come, for one thing. Particularly, I would say, the younger generation does not really realize that we could be on Mars, <laughs> as far as my mother's and, and your grandmother's are concerned. It is so different in terms of what is open and, and the, well, so many things. But I, I do think that the volunteer spirit, which is, I think, very much associated with women, it's not, it's not that men don't volunteer, they do, and the fact that they have not recognized their own potential as much as the as they really can. That makes it so important to think about 
this past as well, and that they're all forgotten heroines all over our friends, our families, and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here. Um, we'd like to open it up to questions now if anybody has any questions for any of our distinguished panel. Yes. Um, I have a question about the, the congressional hearings for uh, Ann Carroll. Uh, were they, did they involve other cases? Were they looking at what were the hearings about? Not just her, I'm assuming. No, it was so just her. It was just her? And how, I mean, how long did this go on in terms of my thinking being like, wouldn't it have been like cheaper to like pay your client? to spend all this time in the hearings or? You know, great minds run in the same direction. <laughs> I said that exact same thing in the book. That uh, at some point, probably around 1890, her, her lawyer, by the way, who was a, a uh, friend of James Garfield, who was president at the time, and I tend to think that he may have been referred uh, to take the case by Garfield. And then his son took up her case after he died. But anyway, he said in re you know a big review of all of her cases, and he was saying you know there's hundreds of documents. I mean, one hearing alone just compiled everything, and that's 150 pages, um, and a lot of you know repeating and all this stuff. He says. Probably just for her literary services alone. She's probably due, including all the interest that would have been owed her, probably due ten to fifteen thousand dollars. And I think it was at that point I said, "Yeah." And as you just accurately said, <laughs> if they had just paid her, you know, twenty-seven years of hearings, <laughs> you know, yeah. consideration, it's who knows what that would have, have been worth. It would have been much cheaper yeah. just to pay the poor woman. Exactly right. Yeah, no, it was because basically, uh, for instance, the nurses' pension bill did not get passed until 1892. So even if when the nurses had come to, co to Congress for relief um, before that time, they had to get private bills passed by the Congress. So since her memorial was again started in 1870, so it was it would have been a bill, uh, you know, a private relief bill for her, and and she was the only case. A question um, regarding the woman herself. I'm trying to get in my head because I don't get a sense of who she really was as a person. I hear the things she did, you know, but where did it start? I mean, was she um, groomed by her father, influenced as such? Um, there was um, obviously something driving her that was unusual, and I'm just I'm just trying to understand her more. Can you? Enlighten us a little bit about the woman. I think you could call say ambition. Um, I mean, first of all, you have to. I mean, we again can't relate to this in terms of, you know, you're dealing with an elite society. Even though the South is more elite than the North was, you're still dealing with people who deferred to people in the upper classes. She came from the Southern elite. The Carroll family, all four clans, all four Carroll lines in Maryland was probably the most important family in the state. Her father had been governor. I think for her what happened, even though supposedly she early on got many proposals for marriage, etc., I think she saw the handwriting on the wall. Her father had trained her early on as his political aide at age 15. She's writing to him with governor, his governor and making her political comments, etc. She was a woman that was driven by politics. Um, and. Uh, she, I think what she must have seen was that marriage would have just stultified her um, and that by hooking her star to her father's wagon, um, she could succeed um, because he opened doors to her. I mean, for instance, if you look at Fillmore's cabinet when he was appointed in 1815, all of those men in her cabinet she, she knew well and she wrote for. Him. So this, and she was attending receptions, uh, you know, when Taylor, you know, was president, receptions when Lincoln was president. Her father op helped open the door. I mean, she did it herself because she was an extremely competent writer. I've also been to the family home, Kingston Hall in Somerset County. It still sits on 300 acres. It's still isolated. I swear it's the same smoke in the walk-in fireplace. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most authentic colonial home I've ever seen, let me tell you. I've slept in her bedroom. Wow. It's isolated. 
there's almost so much embroidery one can do. <laughs> <laughs> so both her father and her mother were extremely well educated. Her mother was supposedly an expert on, you know, British history. Carol's mind was geared to the 17th century, which was pa partly because of her anti-Catholicism. She was a Presbyterian that was still fighting the Anglican and, uh, and Catholic kings, as was much of America. I mean, the issues of the Protestant Reformation were still alive at the time of the Civil War. As I explained last night, the fights over funding for parochial schools in many states, including Maryland, it was not a, just about, mainly about whether you should educate Catholic kids. I'm sure everybody would agree that every child should get an education. But what it was about was separation of church and state, whether you should fund religious schools. But most importantly, a pillar of the Protestant Reformation was that unlike the Catholic Church, you could establish a direct relation with God by searching the word, reading the Bible, and becoming literate by reading the Bible with no clerical intervention. And therefore, Bible teaching in the school and in the home was critical. So the proposal in New York State by Archbishop Hughes was, well, the way to settle this whole issue is we just won't teach the Bible anymore. And therefore, we won't have to choose between whether we're going to teach the Protestant Bible or the Catholic Bible. And three days of riots broke out when that, when that bill was passed. It was, a, it was a religious issue that went, to, you know, 400 years of tradition. And this is just people don't even understand that today. And therefore, they write about the, the Know Nothing movement, et cetera, as just a bunch of bigots. No, there were deep-seated cultural issues in, in this. And there were rights and wrongs on both sides. Anyway, so, so in her mind, she lived in the 17th century. And actually, as Linda Grant DePaul, who was kind of my mentor on military history, and I do World War II, too, um, has stated her book, Founding Mothers, as of 1815, or, or up until 1815, when the novel really came in and probably in some ways destroyed women's lives, <laughs> men and women learned the same things. They studied history, they studied philosophy, and they studied religion. So Anne and Ella Carroll's came from that parent, parental generation. So that's what she studied. So it, it wouldn't have, so she was kind of on the cusp of, you know, women's education and stuff. So. Um, she lived in an isolated physical environment. There wasn't much more for her to do except to do a lot of reading and embroidery. Um, although, I, I, if you read Plantation Mish, there's actually plantation women were more actually farm wives. I mean, they actually had to stuff sausages and stuff like that. It wasn't it wasn't Scarlett O'Hara so much. Uh, I'm sure she did some you know other things, but you once you see even to this day that that house stands on in, in an isolated area you begin to understand her. And I think, again, she, her life, what you, what you see is what you, I mean, what you get is, well, how does that go? She was what you see. Mm -hmm. She was politically oriented and that really consumed her life. Um, she did have women friends. She did go to receptions. Um, you don't get, she did, a, uh, she helped people get jobs during the war, um, especially, you know, young women who were, uh, whose near relatives had been killed and they were left up without support. She did a lot of support for the, the soldiers and stuff. Um, personal interest other than politics, it didn't appear she had any. Politics was her life. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, what's your opinion as to why Congress, not Congress, but the military has failed to prosecute uh, sexual assaults? In terms of the future of the legislation, uh, no. The uh, current number, of their current reported uh, sexual assaults, and have already been reported to in the military. Why haven't they gone forward to prosecute? Well, Congress doesn't prosecute. Uh, I was talking about the legislation, and uh, the fact is that uh, the government, as you know, has been somewhat distracted for the last <laughs> period of time. Um, Senator Gill Gillibrand said it's still alive. They're getting signatures on the legislation. And I think the push is going to have to come from, you know, from the electorate. Um, 
one of the arguments that, that is given is that, oh, it's the same thing that's happening everywhere. It's not just the military. But of course we know that with the command um, influence, the, the vertical structure, there's no way that it's the same. Number one, uh, a, a civilian has much more recourse. I mean, the Uniform Code of Military Justice sets up a separate legal system. So the military are caught in that unless they resign, unless they get out. Now, somebody did bring a lawsuit, so we have to see, you know, it may take two or three years. But the push has to come, really, with people taking it up. First the women taking it up, but, but she has other, some of the, uh, Senator Durbin and uh, 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 Moynihan, so <coughs> they have all signed on to it. So, if, you know, if these things take time. It's, you have to build a campaign for it. Uh, it's, is that what you were asking? No, or, what I, I'm I, asking I, yeah. is why the military itself has, has failed to prosecute. Uh, I mean, are you saying? I'm saying, I understand what you're mm -hmm. saying. They have failed to prosecute because they don't have to. They prosecute. don't have to. <laughs> they do not have yeah. to. It's very simple. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they don't have to. They don't have to prosecute. They, they, they you know, have they're have the to. judge, they're the jury, they're everybody. Right. They, they don't have to. They don't and have and to not prosecute. only that, a commander can overturn a court yes, martial decision. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, the um, head of uh, West Point sent it forward, sent a recent case forward within the uniform code. So there will be a court martial. The next step is a court martial, and that's a big deal. And then you will have military lawyers who are not within the command structure. So you have a much better chance with a court martial to get some resolution. And we'll see that with our own Naval Academy. With the yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, with the. Um, that's the one that we're, yeah. we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Uh, but one other thing, that the women are in such jeopardy because they could either get out, but then it, they won't get an honorable discharge, so they can't go to the VA. And even if they could go to the VA, uh, from what I've been reading in the uh, veterans' newspapers, it is very hard for even an honorably discharged woman to get veterans benefits that would address, health benefits to address the aftermath of sexual and harassment. post-traumatic stress, yeah. Post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. syndrome and other other mental terrible, issues. Terrible, terrible. And, and, and I think it's very uh, hard to get, in other words, they're not being adjudicated in the civilian world much better than uh, in the military. I covered Senator Gil Gillibrand recently and she said they were being threatened so much that a lot of them are withdrawing their, their cases. That's kind of really, and I guess we and should. It, and the question is, is there a military culture that is different and that it, it has been, uh, and it's also been pointed out that sexual predators get into the military and they have free reign. With what the do power do? and control, because it's a power and control issue. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Well. Um, I wanted to ask, I'm reading a particular book right now, and in many countries there is an attempt to suppress women, <clears throat> and I'm wondering why. What is the need to suppress women that I see coming from many different cultures? To me, this military uh, thing of not bringing the cases to, to court, to court-martial, is a way of so it's a new way of putting women in their place. And I'm wondering why that is. Because they can. Because they can. For <laughs> <laughs> real. Um, well, I think it's also that, I mean, it's the, I've, I've hung around the military for about 20 years now and, you know, done a fair amount of research. I mean, I think, you know, some of the reasoning is, um, well, morale and unit cohesion. So if, 
if you bring spurious charges, it'll ruin the, the cohesion of the unit, which is needed for you know military. Well, my response is, what about the men with the contracts? And see other men assaulting women. Mm -hmm. What does it do for their morale? I mean, it's not all, the, all on the bad guy's side. Um, and um, it's. I mean, to my mind, it, it, it just, something has to change. I mean, the Constitution guarantees a trial by jury, and the first establishment principle of the Constitution is establishment of justice. So if a, if a court-martial can be overturned, where is the justice? I mean, Anna Ella Carroll said you can't go out of the Constitution even more time. It's Charles Sumner tried it. <laughs> and, uh, so how, how is it that a military court, which is run by civilians, goes outside of the Constitution by overturning uh, unless it's a lawyer here can explain that to me. It's not run by, court martial is not run by no. civilians. The president is civilian. That's why he's commander in chief. It's a civilian control yeah. of the military. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they write the rules. And how, I mean, how, where is the justice, where is the, the intent of a jury if it can be overturned by somebody's boss? Look. I saw one more uh, question. We've taken one more over here. Uh, I had a question about um, Anna L. Carroll at this uh, Maryland Women's Heritage Center yesterday. I was looking at her portrait there, and uh, the little plaque next to it says, kind of leaves her place in history in question. So I'm hoping after your presentations, and um, I'm, I'm hoping that little plaque next to her portrait will be changed. <laughs> uh, the word of that will be changed. And I also wanted to ask, uh, is the, the noted historian Shelby Foote, is he a descendant of the Foote uh, that you mentioned uh, in this? Um, actually, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I yeah, presume yeah. that's the case. Spelled the same way. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we settled the state of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. um, but there were actually a lot of New Englanders who went south before the war, so they may well have ended up in uh, eastern Mississippi, right? Here, and also there was a famous Henry Foote senator at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, so, oh, and actually it turns out that um, part of the reason Carol's not well known is that most of her family turned their backs on her. Um, as a matter of fact, I traced down her cousins uh, from Nellie's obituary and um, they moved to Mississippi. Her father had a brother in St. Louis. After the war, he moved to actually to Vicksburg and there was actually a Carol Hotel in Vicksburg. So his descendants then became the, the main heirs. And they were all totally lost cause ladies. Uh, as a matter of fact, I talked to the head of the Vicksburg Memorial, and he said, oh, yes, this, what, Florence or whatever her name was, oh, she was one of our dedicated um, volunteers, et cetera. So they were all basically pro-Confederate, and they just totally turned their backs on her. Also, there's some feeling in the family that the Western Shore uh, Carols were better than the Eastern Shore <laughs> Carols, <laughs> considered their poor you know, relatives. So if, if there had been family support, that would have helped a lot, and there wasn't. Well, I recommend that everybody go to Cambridge and, and visit the church and her grave. It's, it's an amazing experience to be there. And come to the film tomorrow. Yes. And, and actually, I have the petition. If anybody wants to sign the petition for the Purple Heart, you're welcome to do that. Yeah, and I have the, the smoking gun or non-smoking gun proof of the existence of a plan in this handwritten letter here. If anyone wants to take a look at that one. And if anyone wants to not believe that anger over the Civil War and how it turned out is still not prevalent, <coughs> visiting one of our southern states recently on the East Coast, I had taken the DVD to them to see if they were interested in showing it or using it as a fundraiser or an activity. And the director that was there was from Pennsylvania. She was very excited and spent almost a whole day Booking Anna Ella Carroll up on the internet. She was very excited. She says, I'm going to take this straight to the board and we will let you know. So two weeks later, I called her up and she said, well, I took it to the board and they were a little bit appalled at me. And they said, whoever has ever cohabitated with Abraham Lincoln is not welcome to sell to the base of Dixon Wow. Wow. Now this is a Still local, very much alive. Yeah. This yeah. is a local historic <laughs> society in a major East Coast city. Well, it's actually gotten so bad that okay. somebody's writing a book about uh, some of the neo-Confederates are actually physically attacking speakers at conferences. It's gotten so bad. 
there's no interest in her story. And uh, I know from last night at the Historic Society, there's a, there's a blank period of Anne Carroll's life, which is 1863 to maybe 1870. What was she involved doing? So maybe we should look at that. That's a little another bit. presentation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, she wasn't involved. Very long <laughs> <story No. here. laughs> That's another. Well, you know, we're going to have to wrap up this afternoon because um, I know you have other things to do, and it's Friday afternoon and the beginning of the weekend. And you can come back tomorrow for more. But I want to thank Frank and Kay and June for a delightful presentation. And for me. Movie so is tomorrow at one. Yeah. We want to thank everybody. And what we have for you, and this is from the Heritage Center and also from the friends of Anna, er Anna L. Carroll, um, and this is your job. Uh, now that you've had an opportunity either today or perhaps yesterday, last night as well, we can now write Anna L. Carroll back into history. So your own personal pen, you can have several for your board. I will take them back. <laughs> and make sure you get one or two when you leave. I have a whole handful of them, and the panel will get one too. So. Anything else? Pretty it's better. especially important because she was in history, as Frank noted and as Kay noted, she was being taught for those who were in their 80s and 70s, and then she got lost. So we do indeed want to write her back into history. So well, please you. share these. <laughs> and we thank you again for coming. Okay, yes. You want to, why don't you say something about it? I will hold up your audio view. Heritage. Heritage area. And uh, there are several sites, I think as many as 20 or so, uh, all through the Baltimore area that all deal with a history of some kind. And uh, we have a passport that uh, people can have stamped at each location.